Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord. Raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let everything that has breath Let's stand together, shall we, and praise the Lord as we sing Psalm 150. You made the starry host, you traced the mountain peaks, you paint the evening skies with wonder. The earth that is your throne, from desert to the sea, all nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord. Raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. As we gather to praise the Lord this morning, our response in worship is a response to the Lord and His revelation to us. So let's read this passage responsibly with me. This is from Psalm 145. I'll begin. The Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Together, one generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. Together, we will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts and we will declare your greatness. We will give a testimony of your great goodness together, and we will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing his greatness, all created. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You reached into the dust, with love your spirit breathed, you formed us in your very likeness. You know your wondrous works to tell your mighty deeds, to join the everlasting chorus. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing his greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let symphonies resound. And choirs ring out, all oh, heaven hear the sound of worship. Let every nation bring its honors to the King, a roar of harmonies eternal. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, sing His greatness. Praise the Lord, raise your voice. 
Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. You join me, please, as we pray together this morning. Oh God, our heart's desire today is indeed to praise the Lord, to recognize your greatness and your goodness. Thank you for your majesty and your mercy, to acknowledge you as our creator and redeemer, Father, Son, and Spirit. We thank you today for the resurrected and exalted Christ. We thank you for the Spirit of God who takes the good things of God and makes them real in our lives. We pray that your spirit today who inspired your word would illuminate it today in such a way that Dr. Williams can proclaim it to us in fresh ways. Grant us ears to hear, hearts willing to respond. We pray that you'd use this time for good to encourage us to bring renewal to our lives, to give direction and guidance for this day and days to come. We thank you for your ongoing blessings to the Southwestern community, and we pray, dear God, for your ongoing enablement for renewal to come to this place. We thank you for your hand of mercy and kindness to us. We pray for those who need your help today and commit them to you. We trust this service to you and ask you now as we continue to lift our voices to you, as we hear your word proclaimed, that you would be honored in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. What a joy it is to see you today as we gather together to worship on this Tuesday following Easter. We trust that you had a wonderful Easter Sunday and a, a wonderful opportunity to worship the Lord in your local community. We're grateful to be led in our worship this morning by uh, Dr. Joe Kreider and Dr. Chuck Lewis and procl proclamation, I mean, acapella, who will be uh, leading us today uh, as they prepare to lead us at the Southern Baptist Convention in Indianapolis in June. Our preacher for the day is uh, Dr. Joshua Williams. We've looked forward to hearing him today. He comes to us as an Old Testamentler who is going to open the New Testament for us. We continue our series in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. A uh, difficult passage, so we needed a skilled exegete to, uh, to come and uh, help us take a look at this passage today. And indeed, Dr. Williams fits that bill. He is an outstanding scholar. His uh, work on First and Second Chronicles, which will be released by Craigel next month, is a much anticipated uh, volume and I know will serve you and serve the church well in days to come. He is a graduate of Southwest uh, Baptist University and holds two degrees from our sister institution in North Carolina, Southeastern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary. He serves as associate professor of Old Testament and director of our uh, doctoral program, uh, PhD program, and we're so grateful to God for him and thankful that the Williams family is here today to cheer him on. We're grateful that you could be here. I know that you'll look forward to hearing God's word proclaimed today by our colleague. We'll continue our reading today from Psalm 145. Would you please hear verses 8, 9, and 10? The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, great in faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassions rest on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. Indeed, God is a good, compassionate, gracious God. We count it a privilege today to worship him, to recognize him as the fount of every blessing. So would you please join us standing as we sing, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. Praise the mountain, fixed 
encouraged this morning. He is always with us, and we will never be alone. Thank you. You may be seated for just a few moments. As the words of David, Psalm 145, continue to direct our response to our triune God, notice that David moves from his proclamations of God's transcendent otherness to wonderful words of intimate nearness. He writes these words. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all his acts. The Lord is near all who call out to him, all who call out to him with integrity. And he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and he saves them. One of the most beautiful works of poetry ever written that expresses the nearness of God is Psalm 23. And at this point in the semester, 
you might need to be reminded of a gentle shepherd's nearness and care for you in a very personal way. Right now, Acapella and Cowden Hall would like to offer this 23 as a prayer. And prayerfully, through the power of the Spirit, as a ministry to our faith community. Psalm 23. shepherd I shall not want in green pastures he makes me lie down he restores my soul and leads me on for his name for his grace
Well, good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning. Uh, that's much better, much better. Thank you, Dr. Kreider, Dr. Lewis, and Acapella, and the Calvin Hall Band. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Um, thank you. And Dr. Dockery, thank you for the invitation to speak in chapel this morning. I do not deserve it. Um, I am an Old Testament scholar, and I'll be preaching out of the New Testament this morning. That's okay, because I have read the New Testament <laughs> once. You know, it was okay. It was kind of like reading a sequel, you know? No, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, when I was in high school and even a little bit of college, I was a track and cross-country runner. And at high school track meets, you never know exactly what you're going to find, what's going to happen. The, sometimes the level in speed is a bit different from the first to the last. And so I want you to imagine with me two runners on a track. They're both going about the same speed. They, they seem to be talking to each other as they're going along. And as they come around what seems like the final stretch, one of them suddenly kind of picks up the pace and runs to the finish line. You know, what in the world is going on? Well, one of those runners had already won the race and was doing a cool down, just kind of, you know, making his way around the track in order to cool down. And the other one was so far behind that he had lost all hope of winning the race. And so he basically wasn't working very hard to get there. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Dr. Yule did a fantastic job of reminding us that Paul had praised the Thessalonians for their faith and their perseverance as they endured persecutions and afflictions. And yet, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 seems to indicate that at least some of the Thessalonians, they had been deceived, conned, lied to, or perhaps just confused about the hope that they had before them. And so the Apostle Paul took time in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to warn them not to be deceived. First, he warned them not to be deceived because what they had heard was fake news. And the real news would be obvious. Second, he warned them not to be deceived because the present hidden enemy will be exposed in full view at the proper time. And third, he warned them not to be deceived because the coming enemy will delude many to their condemnation. And so that we are not deceived, let's take a look this morning at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, first, the Apostle Paul warned them not to be deceived because what they had heard was fake news, and the real news would be obvious. Let's start. You see this in the first five verses of chapter 2, but I'm just going to start by reading the first couple of verses. It says here, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, Brothers, not to be easily upset in mind or troubled, either by a spirit or by a message or by a letter as if from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. So what is this fake news that they had heard? What is it that they were being deceived about? Unsettled. Here it is. The day of the Lord has come. It's already here. But what is this day of the Lord? 
And how does this day of the Lord relate to the coming of Jesus and our being gathered to him? Well, in order to answer this question, I'm going to go to some place that you probably would never expect. I'm going to go to the Old Testament. So the Old Testament describes this day of the Lord in several passages. It occurs in many passages, especially among the prophets, and in particular, the book of the Twelve, otherwise known as the Minor Prophets. And that day of the Lord, kind of the essence of that day of the Lord, it's a time when God comes to intervene, when God comes to take action in the world. And that action, there are two parts, two kinds of actions that God takes when he intervenes. On the one hand, God comes to take action in judgment against wickedness. And just to give you an example, kind of tease this out a little bit, I just want to use one passage. I'm not going to turn there. I'm just going to describe it. But if you look at the book of Joel, the uh, book of Joel has a lot to say about the day of the Lord. And it describes the day of the Lord as a day of darkness and a day of gloom. And then it goes on to depict an army that is marching forward. And in its path is destruction. Joel actually says that before it, the land is like the Garden of Eden. But after it, a desolate wasteland. And this army that is coming, this army that is coming to bring about destruction, it's well trained. Every man moves in his, the way that he is supposed to. Walls are like nothing. To this army. But what may be surprising is that at the end of the description of this army, we find out whose army it is. And it is the Lord who is at the head of the army. This is the Lord's army. The day of the Lord is a day when God will come to take action with judgment against the wicked. And in fact, this day of the Lord then becomes a pattern of God's activity of judgment against the wicked. And if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see that this day of the Lord, this actually takes place on multiple occasions. That when the Assyrians came and destroyed the northern kingdom, this was a day of the Lord. The Lord intervened to bring about judgment on wickedness. When the Babylonians came and destroyed the southern kingdom, this was day of the Lord, when the Lord took action against wickedness. This pattern of God's intervention against the wicked with his judgment. That's one part of the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord, the same time, there's also another aspect to it. And that is, on the day of the Lord, the Lord will restore the righteous. Again, if you look in Joel, after this description of the coming army and the call for repentance, Joel then says, and on that day, whoever will call out in the name of the Lord will be saved. And then immediately following, and the Lord will restore the righteous. He will return them from exile into Judah and Jerusalem. In other words, the Lord, those whom he has dispersed in his judgment, specifically his judgment against Israel, those whom he dispersed in exile, in the day of the Lord, he will also gather up. He will gather them to himself. This is the day of the Lord, a pattern of, of God's activity in the world where he comes to take action. And this understanding of the day of the Lord, it actually helps explain the other elements of these verses, right? Paul says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. Well, the day of the Lord, there are these two actions. One, judgment against the wicked. The second, restoration of the righteous. Well, who's going to do this? 
Who's going to execute God's plan in the day of the Lord? Jesus. Come on now. Right? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, well, obviously the Lord Jesus is going to be working on the day of the Lord. We know him as Jesus. But then there's that, there's that third part to that, Christ. Christ. This is not a last name. One of my former colleagues, Herb Bateman, used to say, he's not Mr. Christ, okay? It's not his last name. It's a role. And what is the other name for this role? The Messiah. Yeah, okay, we're getting warmed up. That's good. The other name for this role is that of Messiah. And in my Old Testament classes, I try to show that from the first pages to the final pages of the Old Testament, there is this recurring image. There is this expectation of one who is coming. This coming one, what will he do? He's the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. He is the lion of Judah who will reign over his people and subdue his enemies. He is that coming king out of Israel who holds the scepter and will smash the forehead of Moab. He is that coming one, the Davidic son, the son of David, who will lead his people in righteous worship of the Lord. That's who that Messiah is. That's who the Christ is. And perhaps it's for this reason that Paul says the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the second coming, right? But the coming of the Lord, the Messiah. Why? Because if I tell you, if I ask you, who is the Davidic son who crushes his enemies before him? Who is this coming king who will subdue all of his enemies at his feet? Who is he? Jesus. That's right. We're talking about Jesus, right? This is Jesus. And he is coming. And when he comes, he's also going to gather us to him. But for some reason, some of the Thessalonians, they had been confused from some source. They had been led astray. They felt like they had missed out. They were missing something. The Apostle Paul talks about it here, whether it's a spirit or a word or a letter that's supposedly sent from us. These are all the usual suspects, right? Who would be able to lead somebody astray in this matter? Well, it's probably going to be something like some prophetic utterance that's come from the congregation or from somewhere else or something that appears to be from an authoritative figure like Paul or his companions. And what is the harm here? I mean, what does it matter if they're led astray in this matter? The day of the Lord has come. Well, there are two things, and I think the Apostle Paul cares about both of these. On the one hand, those who are suffering, those who are enduring the persecution, if for some reason they think the Lord has already come, what do they have to look forward to? Why endure? Why continue the suffering if we missed God's coming in order to judge the wicked and to restore the righteous? But on the other hand, there's another side to this as well. And that is those who might lose motivation because the end is here. Right? If God is already doing this now, then what motivation would I have to stick it out, to stay with He approaches both of these. But so that we're not deceived, let's take a look at the safeguard that the Apostle Paul gives against deception regarding the day of the Lord. So let me read verses 3 through 5. Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless 
the rebellion or the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's sanctuary, publicizing, proclaiming himself that he is God. But don't you remember that when I was still with you, I told you about this? Right? The safeguard that the Apostle Paul is going to bring against deception are these two preconditions. He reminds the Thessalonians what he's already told them. Two things have to happen. The first is rebellion or apostasy. Now, some view this as kind of a, a spiritual turning away or hardening. Others say that this rebellion will be political, civil unrest, the lack of authority. Um, I don't think there's any reason to think that these two are mutually exclusive. I think if you look at the pattern of Old Testament prophecy, it's more likely this notion of uh, lack of authority, the breakdown of authority, a rebellion of this kind. That's the, the first precondition. This has to happen. The second precondition is the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction or the son of perdition. Now, we learn a couple of things about him. First of all, he's known as the son of lawlessness or the son of sin. And the second is that he's the son of destruction. Now, this, the son of destruction, let me just mention that really quickly. This is the same phrase that's used for Judas in John 17, right before Judas betrays Jesus. And it seems that in the context of there and also in the context here, that the son of destruction would be the one destined for destruction. Because Jesus says, look, I have kept all of those that you have given to me except for the one who is devoted to destruction, right? The son of destruction. And here also we see that this man of lawlessness will be destroyed. He's also the, the this man of lawlessness who opposes himself. Now, this description of him, he falls in line with many others that have preceded him, right? There are others read through, reading through the Old Testament who sound just like this. You find them, the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14, or the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, or that wicked king in Daniel 11. They also proclaimed that they are God. And yet, this man of lawlessness seems to go even beyond those predecessors. Because not only does he boast that he is God, but he displays himself as God by entering into God's sanctuary and seating himself on God's throne. This man of lawlessness epitomizes all of the lawlessness that we see coming through in the Old Testament. It's like a culmination of what has been happening previously. Therefore, because this man of lawlessness will come, we know that the day of the Lord has not come yet. And this is so important about Paul's point. These two preconditions, they will be obvious. That's his point. There's no guessing. You don't have to sit around saying, oh, is that the man of lawlessness? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, is this the rebellion that he's talking about? I don't know. I don't know. Paul did. Paul said, it will be obvious that he will be revealed. So, listen, brothers... Now, second, don't be deceived because the present hidden enemy will be exposed in full view at the proper time. 
Read with me. Verses 6 through 8. And you know what currently restrains him. So that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. But the one restraining will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him, slay him with the breath of his mouth. And will bring him to nothing with the brightness of his coming. Oh boy, okay, here we go. You know, this uh, text raises a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Uh, Who? Who is the man of lawlessness? What? What is restraining him? When? When is this going to take place? Where? Where will the son of lawlessness reveal himself? Where will he exalt himself as God? Who? What? When? Where? Where? How? How is this going to happen? Why? I think we all know why. Um, that's not one of the questions he raises. This, this, this text raises many, many, many questions. But I have a little motto when it comes to things like this. Okay, Here's my little motto. In the absence of information, there is speculation. Now, We could speculate all day long about what's going on here. What lies behind this text? What is it that the Thessalonians knew? Right? Paul says, you know what's restraining him. It's kind of like one of those situations in class where you say, you know when the assignment is due, don't you? And the student says, well, of course I do, but why don't you repeat it for everybody else in the class? Right? It's like, yeah, of course I do. Of course, of course we do, Paul, but could you repeat it for the rest of us out here? We could speculate all day long. But here's what I say. Rather than a fascination with speculation, my meditation will be on the revelation. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to spend my time, my mental energy not speculating on what it does not say, but holding fast to what it does. And what does it say? Well, it says that currently what that man of lawlessness embodies, what he epitomizes is already at work, presently, in secret, Hidden, that same arrogance against God, that same opposition to what God stands for is already presently at work. Now, for the Thessalonians, it's almost no doubt based upon what we see in chapter 1 that they are experiencing this lawlessness by those who persecute And afflict them. They are the ones who stand opposed to God and his people. In our day, we still see the same power secretly operating. Those who oppose God and his people and exalt themselves against God. That's one thing that it clearly states. There is a second aspect to that. And that is that this will happen, that that secret power is being held in check until the proper time, according to God's plan. So, according to God's plan, according to his time, that secret power now is held in check until it is removed and the lawless one will reveal himself. That's the first thing. It's clearly there. The second thing, even though the lawless one is full of arrogance and epitomizes opposition to God, Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth. With the word, he will destroy 
that one, the one who stands opposed to all that God is, with a word, Isaiah 11:4, with the breath of his mouth, he will slay the wicked. This is what is revealed, that in God's timing, the power that now operates in secret, checked, held back, that power is going to express itself fully and in full view when the lawless one comes. And you know what? He'll be exposed for who he is when the Lord Jesus slays him. So do not be deceived because the hidden present enemy will be exposed in full view at the proper time. Third, Paul said, do not be deceived because the coming enemy will delude many to their condemnation. Read with me in verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false, so that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but enjoyed unrighteousness. This passage presents a contrast between the coming of the lawless one and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two different kinds of coming. The coming of the Lord Jesus, it happens in order to fulfill God's plan. Right? Execute judgment against the wicked, restore the righteous. The coming of the lawless one, it happens according to Satan's plan. That's what it says. He has come to do Satan's work and to use Satan's methods. He uses signs and wonders. I think a good uh, place to look to get some background for this verse is Deuteronomy chapter 13. Beginning of Deuteronomy 13, Moses tells the people of Israel, in the future there will be a prophet or a dreamer of dreams who comes to you with signs and wonders. And when he's done, he will say to you, let's go worship other gods. Moses says, don't believe him because the Lord is testing you to see whether you love the Lord your God or not. That same logic is here. That same logic is here. He will use the methods of Satan. And those who will be deceived by these methods, they fail the test, don't they? They demonstrate that they're not loyal to the Lord. And so in this way, there's a contrast, not just between the lawless one who's coming and Jesus who is coming, but also a contrast to their followers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul said that because of the Thessalonians' endurance and perseverance among their afflictions, that they then proved themselves worthy. I think... Dr. Ewell last week used the word fit, which is, I think, the right word. They show themselves fit for the kingdom of God. They look like a citizen of God's kingdom. In contrast, those who follow the lawless one's lies, they show themselves fit for condemnation. And because... They are fit for it. God confirms them in it. Because this is what the truth of God's word does. It cuts two ways. For the righteous, it brings 
repentance, and more righteousness. And for the wicked, it hardens and confirms them in their wickedness. You know, it's easy to think, uh, that'll be those people. They'll be the ones deceived. But notice, notice that this passage is bracketed by this comment. Don't be deceived. Paul tells the Thessalonians, don't be deceived. And here at the end, he's talking about deception. So who are these people who will be deluded by the lawless one? What are they like? Well, they're just like the people that are opposing the Thessalonians. They're persecuting and afflicting them. They're opposed to God and God's people. And so what will happen? They will receive their just punishment. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Jesus is coming with the angels in the clouds, and he will bring down the judgment that they deserve. This is the truth. But you know what? There was one among those persecutors. There was one among those persecutors whom the Lord stepped in and saved. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the very man who wrote this letter. A persecutor. Opposed to God's people. Persecuting them. Afflicting them. And yet, because of the incredible grace, the amazing grace of God, that persecutor was saved. Translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Look, we have work to do we have work to do there are those who now they are on the precipice of being led astray by the power that's already at work it's secret it's hidden but the lies of the lawless one they're already at work we have work to do to show ourselves fit for the kingdom of god and to beg and to plead for those who are on the threat of being deceived to believe the truth, to love the truth, and thereby be saved. So don't be deceived because the coming one will delude many to their condemnation. So in this passage we see Paul He warns the Thessalonians, and he warns us, don't be deceived because what they had heard, fake news, but the real news will be obvious. Don't be deceived because the present hidden enemy will be exposed in full view at the proper time. And don't be deceived because the coming enemy will delude many to their condemnation. Now I want you to imagine with me a Christian sister. A Christian sister who has only recently become a convert. Because of her conversion to Christ, her family has disowned her. Her neighbors mock her. She can find No friends, no solace, there's no welcome home. And in some of the dark moments, you can hear the enemy whisper, you missed it. Your hope of this coming day of the Lord, you missed it. What would you say to her? Here's what I would say, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived because Jesus is coming and he will judge the wicked and restore the righteous. I also want you to imagine a young man, Christian brother, a little brash maybe, but he has decided, you know what? The end of the world is coming. So I think I'll just sit back and relax. I mean, what's the point, right? 
What's the point? If the end of the world is coming, I'm not going to invest in anything. I'm not going to spend time preparing. Why would I do any of that? Jesus is coming. What would you say to that brother? Don't be deceived. Jesus is coming. But there's still work to do. Now imagine that one out there right now who they don't know. They have some general sense of spiritual things. Maybe they've heard part of the Bible read. Maybe they've heard John 3.16 at some point. But they don't, they don't believe. They haven't believed the truth. They're deluded. They're deceived. And the enemy whispers to them, none of it's true. You can do whatever you want because there is no judgment. Nobody's coming to get you. There's no accountability, no reckoning, no retribution. What would you tell? What would you tell them? Don't be deceived because Jesus is coming. Listen, don't be deceived because Jesus is coming and there's still work to do. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, this is your word. Father, I am so thankful that you did not leave us to our own devices to try to figure out who you are. Lord, you have given us everything that we need, all the instruction that we need to know you and to know you truly. And so, Lord, I pray that you would protect our hearts from deception. Lord, don't let us be deceived, but instead to place our hope, our fascination, and our meditation on your coming. All these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? There is work to do. And we do that in the power of the cross. Yeah. 
Listen to this benediction from Psalm 145. My mouth will declare the Lord's praise. Let every living thing bless his holy name forever and ever. And beware and do not be deceived. God bless you. You're dismissed.